Okay, folks, we're going to begin here this morning. We'd like to welcome everybody to our virtual open house here for the month of December. <clears throat> uh, we are happy to be able to provide the virtual open houses. Honestly, we'd be much happier to be open. Uh, and we continue to get many calls and emails and Facebook messages saying, when are you going to reopen? Uh, and so we can come and see the center. The answer is we're not sure yet. Maybe, <clears throat> maybe March, maybe April, we're hoping, but we're going to be discussing that as a group. As uh, the vaccine gets out there and things open up a little bit more, uh, we'll look for some ways to get the center open again. So those of you that have not been here yet or been here before, want to come back, can come back. And honestly, we'd like to have the center open as well. So we're looking forward to that time. But in the meantime, we, uh, we are continuing our series here on the virtual open houses just to share with you some of the work that we're doing or have done and some processes, some clinics here, some things that you can use in your own modeling. And uh, so we have new people that join us every month for this uh, webinar. And uh, we also have a loyal group, those people that have been uh, with us for several or many or some of you, all of these. And so we, uh, we appreciate you joining us here again this morning. Uh, and by the way, you see there is a, a chat feature on the, the Zoom platform here. <clears throat> so if you have a question, um, put it in that chat area and we're gonna keep an eye on that and we'll try to get all your questions answered uh, during the webinar itself, especially when we're on a particular topic and uh, anything that we haven't answered, we'll answer before we wrap up for uh, this particular session. So let's talk about where we're headed today. You saw on the invitation, the latest photos and uh, of short videos of our displays along with some narration. So we'll talk about that. We'll be spending a lot of time on uh, the Sundance Central in conversation today because our next topic and that is moving the Sundance Central modular layout. If you've seen it before, you know it's a pretty giant footprint and uh, it's pretty intricate, about 40 by 40 approximately. <clears throat> and we'll show you the engineering behind that, how you move that. It's literally traveled the country from coast to coast, from Portland, Oregon to Portland, Maine, from Los Angeles to Hickory, North Carolina, to Kansas City, to St. Louis. It's been everywhere, man, as they say in the song. And so we're gonna show you how we move that and how that works, how we put it all back together. Um, and then also there's a technique here that you can use in your modeling regardless of your scale. And that is what we call frocks or foam rocks. So Richard's going to uh, talk about the process for building those foam rocks. You'll see some examples and the steps. And then John Addison is gonna do a segment for us on how to weather wood, because so many of you use wood in your models and your buildings, or they're doing cribbing or all kinds of places, plenty of places to use real wood and weathering it to, to make it look realistic is really important. So John's gonna share some techniques that he uses that you can use in your modeling as well. So for those of you that have been here before, you know this is what our typical open house looks like. This is why we're not open today because it's tough to socially distance. When we do open, we'll probably have a limitation on capacity. We'll see what that looks like. But you know, typically we're pretty full to see people here sitting in the clinic area. Um, and so we have not been open really since February. That's the, the last live open house that we've done. <clears throat> we have multiple displays. Here's the O scale operating uh, switching layout. The Joe Carrillo is running for our guests. And uh, you see that people can actually make switching moves with this layout. It's very popular. And here you see a segment, a portion of the Sundance Central. And the next several pictures will give you some sense for how we're laid out. Uh, this is actually, as you're looking from the front to the back on the right side of the building, you see we have multiple displays. Uh, the Sundance Central is the centerpiece, but you know we have military dioramas. You can see several there. And uh, some additional, we actually have five operating layouts. The Muskrat Ramble you see in the background there is uh, from an Australian group. So it's traveled a long way to be here in the Suncoast Center for fine scale modeling. <clears throat> As you look to the left side of the building front to back here, you can see Charlie Belcher from Channel 13. You get some sense for at least the front side and the uh, the yard that uh, juts out here for the Sundance Central, how big this is and uh, how intricate it is. And by the way, the rocks that you see going down to the floor, uh, just uh, below the turntable there, those are foam rocks, all right? So we'll talk about you know, how to use those in your modeling. We do build layouts here. We do have several uh, workrooms in the back and a shop. Here's when we were in the midst of constructing the uh, Lakeshore Industrial Railway. That's the O-scale switching layout to talking to you about. In the back room here, we're working on the, uh, the backdrop. And so a lot of the work on the layouts happens in the building and we've got all the facilities and tools to do that. But most of the modeling on specific projects like buildings, 
certainly rolling stock, other details uh, happens at home, and then we, uh, we bring it all together. So let's head to our first topic here. And this is how do you move the Sundance Central? How do we get it across the country? It's really all about the engineering. So how do you take it apart? How do you transport it? And how do you reassemble a 40 by 40 foot layout? Now, what we're gonna share with you first here is actually a time-lapse video. It's about a minute and a half long. And it shows the entire sequence when we uh, set the layout up. I think this was from Hickory, North Carolina. So I'm gonna share this with you. It's about a minute and a half long. You'll see it in time-lapse form, and then we'll go back and show you the specific engineering that makes all this possible. Okay, here's where the video begins. Okay, so there you go. That's what it looks like. Uh, Time-lapse photography. By the way, I believe that was a little bit over, we have time, but that was a little bit over 14 hours. And that's what you saw there in a minute and a half. So let's take a look. So guys, if you wanna sign on here, the uh, our panelists, I'm sure that uh, you have some comments. This is how it began. <laughs> the last time we transported, this is a 53 foot trailer, all right, with a lift gate. And so, that's what it looks like when it's empty. That's what the capacity is. Um, and we had this thing packed all the way to the end. Um, and so as we go through here, you can see we're in a, we're probably about two thirds unloaded in, uh, in this particular shot. Um, and you'll see that there's a lot of engineering by way of how we, uh, essentially how, how we put all these things together, how there's a place for everything and everything in its place and then we have an anchor within the truck. So um, let's continue on with some of the photographs here. We have, the modules are in different forms. We have some cabinets I'll show you here in a minute where we slide the, the modules in, uh, but there are some different, uh, some different platforms. This one, this is uh, the one we're pulling out now. You can see the truck is backed up against the loading deck. That uh, This comes out, it's on wheels and uh, there's a storage case underneath that has, I believe Dave, that has the, uh, the engine house underneath, right? That's what we're looking at. Yeah, that's the single biggest one. That module has its own case, and it's it's it's, it's huge. So, um, yeah, that's that's what's in there. And then on top of it, we pack uh, other parts of it. So that they're all screwed down or attached down, so that we can uh, utilize as much space as possible. Yep. So the uh, here's another shot. Uh, this is where we're pulling out that same case. So. You can see that the, the top comes off. We have another module sitting on top. That is the uh, sawmill, right? 
And so, but it, you see, if you look here by Richard's hand down here, you see that everything here, we got an L bracket that holds that in place. You can see over here on the other side as well. So again, there is a specific plan for every module because not all modules and buildings obviously have the same shape. Let's continue on. I mentioned to you the cabinets. Um, Dave or Frank, I don't know if you guys want to talk about these cabinets. We built these specifically. Here's what they look like. Um, and you see that we have them numbered. So why don't you guys jump in and give us some detail about how these work. Frank, go ahead. Well, Dave and I took it upon ourselves to get this thing rolling. And that's how we did it. Uh, we made six cabinets in this configuration. Some of them are tall like this one. There's three tall ones and three shorter ones. And uh, they all have shelves in them. And so each module is either is labeled three, A, B, C, whatever. So three would go into this cabinet and A, B, C would correlate to the uh, shelves. Either one of those, in this particular case, three shelves. The other cabinets we have, the, the uh, tall ones like this are for the corner modules or, and there's four corner modules. And then there's uh, other cabinets that have like five or six shelves in there, which just handle the, the straight old flat modules. And then on the ends of each cabinet, there's a bracket that holds the legs, the two by two legs. And then on top, you can see we've got other things all strapped down in cases. And then besides these six modules with the cabinet doors on them, we have probably four or five other modules that contain or are in various configurations and they contain uh, other things like trees, buildings and uh, tools and all kinds of stuff. And then there's another module that just contains the turntable. Uh, the turntable was such a problem, we ended up making a complete module for it. So underneath the turntable, we store all our electrical equipment. Yeah, we have some photographs of showing here in a minute, Frank, on some of that. And so that would be good. You could point out which ones you're talking about. Notice at the top, it's looking like a car top carrier, right? We built the, uh, the wood frame around the top. It's on hinges, right? That, that with the holes drilled out that allow us to use the bungees to keep everything secure during transportation, right? That's correct. And the reason we hinged it was just so we could slide stuff off and right. make it easier access. So let's keep going. Uh, the bungee in this case is one of those cargo net bungees. Okay. okay. And then the uh, next, yeah, go to the next one, Jim. Yeah. So yeah, in this case here, we've got uh, a module that contains a lot of buildings because in most, in 90% of the cases here, we, all of our buildings come off and they all have to go back in a specific place. So there's locators. And then if you get to the tree module, there's each tree has a number on it. So on the layout, there's a, a pin with a flag on it with a particular number, one through 60 or 70, whatever it is. And then each tree is numbered. So you take the pin out of the module, put the tree in, put the pin back where you found it on the tree carrier. Yeah, one thing to note in this picture behind Richard there, you see that is an insert with the rock face that is below the turntable. I don't know if he's holding it there or it's up against that pillar, but it doesn't weigh much. Foam construction and foam rocks uh, makes that very transportable. So, you know, these are what the modules look like. This is a quarter module. This is Frank and me carrying one of those. Who wants to jump in and talk about the, uh, the framework that we use, size lumber, all that sort of stuff? Well, it's a uh, one by four, which is nominally what? Three quarters by three and a half. And then there's, uh, so the framework is made out of that. Then there's two inch insulation foam for the base. And there's uh, bracing underneath it to support that. This particular piece here is a corner module. You can see the curves on it. And uh, there's uh, all kinds of, uh, numbers and letters and stuff, because we went through several renditions of how to label and number this thing. So there's all kinds of them on there. <laughs> and then uh, there's a that white PVC coupling you see in the back is how we attach our backdrop. It uh, goes into there. Right. Yeah. You so may want to mention, Frank, that uh, the foam that we use is an extruded foam. It's not the one that's 
It's got the beat of foam that falls apart. Yeah, it's yeah, styrene foam. Yeah. No it's beat of foam. called Dowboard. That's a common name for it. That's actually a brand name, but that's how they reference. It's usually pink, blue, and somehow we got it in gray. Yeah, so we say Dowboard, uh, Dave, you mean D-O-W, like the uh, brand name? Correct. Yeah. This could be tough to find, by the way. You can't go into Home Depot or Lowe's and buy this. They do have one-inch uh, foam. And some people I've seen building layouts have stacked two one-inch together and glued them to make two inches. Um, but, you know, it's a little bit tricky to find the two-inch stuff. But when you, you do, I mean... It's it's places that sell big outlets that sell insulation because that's what it's used for. So down in, for instance, where we live, down in Largo, there was a big insulation material seller down there. And that's where we could buy it before. And then, then we had Keith's great deal and we haven't had to buy it since. All right. Yeah, so the two inch high density extruded foam is magic, not just for these bases. You can build so many things out of it, which we do. All right, let's continue on. So here, this is yet another, this, this was scaffolding, right? That we essentially put the wood pieces across. Am I right about that, Dave? Yeah, we, uh, this was actually the, late, the last modules we added to the, I believe that's correct, the last modules we added, and so we had scaffolding, so we decided to use the scaffolding and convert that into a way of transporting those modules because we never built, you know. This, this is the lumber camp area. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's, a, yeah, it's the logging, logging area in the, lumber, in the logging camp. So what do we do on these straps? We just bent them to shape based on what we're trying to hold in place? Well, being in Florida, we have plenty of access to hurricane clips. Ah. <laughs> but they're, they're actually just metal straps that you use in construction to uh, build decks and all other kind of wood framing with. Right. Yep. OK, so let's continue on. So here, this is the turntable section. Uh, this is what you were talking about, Frank, is its own freestanding unit, right? How do we right. Open, we then it's got it's got four adjustments on it so that whatever the floors are, we can kind of make minor adjustments in the height of the module. Yeah, so, and there's storage underneath it there, by the way, um, as we move this thing, but this is one thing that actually ends up as part of the layout. It's not a cabinet that we store until we move it again. Right, uh, this is the pretty much the last piece we put in. So right. here's another module coming off with, uh, with the legs and uh, the, uh, backdrop supports on the end. Yeah, and so we, obviously a, another module on top. Right. Yeah, so we built those, uh, the, the essentially the pockets there to hold the uh, PVC for the backdrop. And you see some of the legs, the two by twos. So again, you think about how you use the space because you know we filled up a 53 foot van, essentially a 53 foot trailer. If we had not done this engineering, we probably needed a trailer and a half. And it's very expensive to have this moved. The, it was paid for by the narrow gauge convention in uh, Kansas City. They're not going to give us two trucks. So we have to have the engineering to be able to get it into to one truck. I want to yeah. point out one other thing that uh, when we did this, we drew the first time we did it, we moved it with two 26 foot Penske rental trucks with the lift tailgate. And we drew out on the floor with tape the 26 foot and we started moving moving things around and once we got everything to fit those two 26 foot areas we wrote it down and made a diagram of how it all went together and we did the same thing on this 53 foot semi truck yeah yep there's a diagram it goes in an order it's not like uh well, let's see if we can put this in next uh, so there you can see there's another one of the modules that uh, is stored on top of one of the cabinets again utilizing the space. And, you know, I can tell you, you know, if you've seen the layout, how detailed it is. We have had minimal damage moving this layout and we've moved it, I don't know how many, a dozen times all across the country. Sometimes it's been in a pod in storage for several months when it went from Los Angeles to Portland, Oregon. And we've had minimal damage the way we've been able to pack it. And I, I want to point out it was prior to the recent Portland, Oregon. Right. Hey, just a just a quick question came up, Jim, while we're on this. Uh, somebody had asked, William had asked, have you ever seen any compression of the Dow board after 10 years? No. No, I don't think so. 
It is the most stable. I would recommend Dow Board to build every diorama that you make on Dow Board. It's set stable. I gave up plywood years ago. You just went to Dow Board. You, can you may have to support it a nice little job. more. Pardon? You may have to support it a little more underneath than three quarter inch plywood, but by God, it, it only weighs ounces versus you know, 10, 15 pounds for a module. And some of the original modules for Sundance Central that's still operating today were built in 1994, if I believe, think that's correct. So yeah, well, 16 like, years. Yeah, most of the modules. Yeah, and, and they're still going along just fine. Yeah, so here's another corner module you can see, and this is how we transport them. And now in, these, in this particular case, actually this isn't a corner, this is from the yard, right? Yeah. Now that's the crossover. Crossover? Yeah. Okay, but you see, the uh, the conifers there, they stay right in place and the trees right. behind it. They start, stay right in place during the uh, transportation in this particular case. And you can see the modules behind it are also stacked up with stuff. Right. So continuing on, this is um, this is the backdrop for behind your trestle, right, Frank? Yes, it's here. all it's all frocks. Yeah, it's all foam. If this was plaster <laughs> or Real rock, there'd be no chance for us to move a rock this face plaster, aside. If this was plaster, Frank would have quit years ago. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, this is uh, what it looks like um, on the uh, when we have it on a cart, right? So there's the module. You see another module behind it. Um, and so, actually, I guess we trained that extremely tall tree stayed on there, Frank, apparently. Yep. Uh, actually, the module, the back piece here is actually a module by itself. It's on a small cabinet with uh, four inch wheels on it and it just rolls right up into place and we lock it down, clamp it and we're done. Yep, I remember that. It's been a while since we've done this. Yes, it has. <laughs> you see, by the way, we have grab handles to make it easier to, uh, to handle these things as well. So you think about, you know, if you're gonna be on the road, what can you do to make this happen? Now uh, this, um, this is Hickory, isn't it? No. I'm not sure which, which city this is. Um, I think this was Portland. Okay. Uh, Portland, Maine? Uh, no, uh, or it's right. the two story. Uh, so anyway, I just shot this picture. This is kind of what it looks like when we start to unload all of this stuff. You can see, you know, it's what it looks like. It's kind of like the circus coming to town. Um, it's the big top. And so we become the roadies to take all of this and, and put it together. Uh, the clouds, Jim. Right, <laughs> the clouds, right. And you see on the right-hand side, by the way, that particular uh, rolling module for storage weighs a ton because it's got all of our rolling stock and brass locomotives on there. Uh, but and that's toward, how we transport that. Toward the middle of the floor there, you'll see a column and there's a module there that has our yard on it. Right. All those irregular shaped pieces for the yard. Right. Yep. You see how we strap those down on a dolly. So, you know, we have these. This is what it looks like when we start unloading this into the space. And then, of course, there's always a little bit of a strategy session here and trying to determine who's in charge. But you got to operate as a group. You got to do this in 14 hours, really over two days. And we have to get there earlier than other modules just because it's so big, modular displays be able to do it. So here's some of the first steps, right? You're measuring out the floor to be able to determine location, right? Yeah, we try to figure out, you know, the best location for the two end pieces, which have the curves in them. So we try to figure that out. And then uh, when we start playing the mod, we actually start putting the modules together. We start with the crossover in the middle and work our way out from the middle. Right. Because uh, especially, you know, when you go into a place and they, you have to uh, allow for other modules and other venues and things like that, we, we need to figure out where we're going. Right. And so here's a picture you can see we're putting the legs. We have pockets in the corners, right? Where the two by twos just go in. Right. So they just slide in. That way we can, the modules are all flat. And so this is how we connect them together. You can see Keith underneath there. Um, we have uh, wooden dowel pins that uh, between the, all of the, uh, the modules. 
to, for alignment, but we're holding them together with C-clamps. So you got a big bucket of C-clamps you bring with us. Um, here's another picture. Here's Dale working underneath on some of the, uh, the C-clamps. So you can see how the sections go together and we get them nice and tight because the track has to align, the trains have to run. Um, this is actually Portland, Oregon. Uh, there, we were too big to be inside the hall. So they had us set up in the lobby of the uh, hotel. We certainly garnered a lot of uh, curiosity seekers as we were building this uh, in this space. And so you can see, this is a little bit farther along in the setup and the construction. We've got all the modules in place um, and we put the uh, PVC pipes up to begin working on hanging the backdrop, things of that nature. Um, but... you, can, you can see the amount of clutter we bring because underneath the layout is all materials and accessories and everything. Right. And eventually we have that all covered up with our black draping, but you know, we, we need that storage because um, you know, the generally is not a separate spot for storing uh, all the cases. And so Frank, you're talking about the placement for the tree. Here's a good example, right? There you go. That's it. Number 62, come up. Right. And there's another one. Yeah. <laughs> Number six goes there. Now you mentioned the, uh, what we had to store the trees. Obviously we've placed most of the trees in this particular shop, but here you see some examples. There's still some trees to be placed. And so, you know, if you don't know where these trees go, <laughs> you travel across the country and try to put this whole thing together, it doesn't work. Right. Um, and so we have built uh, this to store the trees and to be able to essentially catalog the trees. Um, here's an interesting shot. This is kind of like who gets to be in the back of a horse costume. <laughs> uh, but, you know, you see all, all of us do have heads and bodies there, but you see the hands at the top. Once we put up the PVC piping, then our backdrop, uh, we essentially are putting in place to clip at the top. Now, Dave, talk to us a little bit about the material and how that backdrop works. Well, the material is the same kind of material they use for when you go to a, like a convention and they use those booths, those very portable booths they put up for different, uh, you know, conventions and or or uh, or like if you go to a show and they're selling you know, they have the displays, I forget what you call them, but um, it's the same material. So it's very flexible um, and it's, it was printed on, so it's, it's pretty durable, and it, and it, uh, but it's only, it's only mills thick, it's very thin. So literally this backdrop hangs, uh, it's attached to the top and hangs. So we have to get the adjustment to get, you can see a wrinkle in this one. We have worked to get the wrinkles out. That's what we're trying to do right now. Yeah, All because it's, it's only in two pieces of one piece must be how long. The one piece probably is about 45 feet long, isn't it, by the time it wraps around both sides? Yeah, there's, there's, I think there's, we've got three or four sections, and we tried to limit it, it, as many of the seams as possible. And it, when you come here, we've done a pretty good job of hiding the seams. Yeah, so here's a picture of what it looks like when it's up, right? And so if you look here at the top, you see that we have binder clips. That's how we're, we're essentially clipping this on to the, uh, the flat board at the top, right? And we have painted them blue, so they pretty much match the color of the sky. Now, now the, the other notable thing here is the lighting. Yeah. Because when you come to the center, we made what's essentially called a cloud ceiling for it, which was you know, a pretty big endeavor. But when you take it on the road, that cloud can't go. So we have lighting that we use, and you can see two, two, uh, two of the um, lighting elements here. Uh, that we use for road work, and, and uh, that's that allows us to light it on the road. Otherwise, we'd be in the now, dark. Those are halogen spots, right? Correct. Nice. Correct. Probably technology's left us behind there, but yes. Yeah. So, and by the way, those essentially um, those rods you can extend out to whatever length you need to the maximum length if necessary. Um, almost like a, the old rabbit ears TV antenna you pull out. And uh, then you can adjust the angle of the light because there's certain things you want to be able to light in the display, right? So you put it together. Here's what it looks like when it's all set up. Uh, and you, you again, you see the lights that extend out um, all the way around the layout. And you know, part of it is, is fine tuning the lights so that uh, we have a picture of that. I don't think that's, yeah, that's in the, go ahead. That's, that's before LEDs. So we were using halogen nowadays with 
have to go to LEDs. All right. And you see that on the right here, we have footlights that uh, shine up to the, what is a trestle section here so that all that backdrop gets lighted. We don't have it, or maybe we do. You can barely see it across the top here over the yard. Uh, since we don't have a backdrop there, we tried to figure out what we could do to make sure there was enough light in the yard area. So those are essentially two strings of lights with halogens attached that are connected here on this uh, black post and here on the black post and over here. It sort of comes out in a Y section. Am I right about that? Who's got more detail? No, that you're right about that, Jim. And then we hang the light fixtures from that uh, string well, cord going across. Right. Yeah, so there you have it, folks. That's how you move a 40 by 40 foot layout across the country, get it back together in a reasonable period of time, make it look presentable, and then pack it up and take it home. Um, it seems to me we tear this thing down in probably about five or six hours. It doesn't take as long to tear it down as, uh, as it does to put it up. But if we're gonna be displaying at a train show, if the train show is gonna kick off, say on a Thursday, we're there working all day Tuesday, and then probably Wednesday till about lunchtime or a little bit thereafter to get it all set up and ready to go. And then we have Velcro for our curtains on that final step, et cetera. Um, and then we're on display and then we can generally tear it down if the show uh, closes, say at four o'clock, we're generally out of there by about 9 p.m. So This particular uh, scene here is from Hickory, North Carolina. And it takes, it took us two 26 foot Penske trucks for the Sundance Central. And if you look against the back wall over there, you'll see the muskrat ramble, which we also carried that up there. So the oh, guys from Australia could operate the muskrat ramble. And then we took it back to uh, Florida with us. And that's now part of the permanent display at the uh, center. I forgot about that. That is the muskrat ramble back there. Yep. Now part of the center. So there you go, folks. One go thing ahead. you may talk about, Jim, is you know, when we kept connect these modulars to modular, we still got to connect the track. Yep. So we got rail clamps at each one of the rails connecting them. So we got around and fasten all those. When the yep. Sunday first started, it was track power. Uh, and it ran flawlessly until the time that I uh, started looking at getting involved in doing uh, battery operation, which we uh, converted to all the locomotives. So there's no electric running through those rails. And it yep. really helps out when it comes to the yard and all the uh, switches and what, that we don't have to worry about polarity of the current. Yeah, we used Hillman rail clamps to uh, hold those together. Um, so that's a good point, Richard. The other thing is, is now that we don't have track power, we don't clean the track. So when you're leaning across the track, you will get uh, black marks. Almost looks like a grill mark on your arm because that, that track gets dirty. Tim, it's a good it's a good time to point out though that this that in model railroading there is a constant conflict between scenery and running of the railroad. It's a battle because if you do really good scenery, it's not it it's a dirty situation for running this you know track powered trains. That's yes. the reason that going to battery just made perfect sense. One is because something like this, it's in 40 sections, is a pain to try to get all that continuity of power to go through the track. But the other issue is, is that, you know, the, the trains, if things aren't perfect, they run much better if you just do battery power versus track power. And believe me, there are certain people who just are into operations who could care less whether they have any scenery. But... Um, we're all about the scenery, so that was a good fit for us. Yeah, by the way, for those of you wondering, the rail on here is aluminum rail. Um, I'm not sure what the code is. What is it, 250 maybe? Oh, 250, Jim. Yeah, 250 aluminum rail. Um, and so, you know, the foam has held up well over the years. The, some of the curves uh, got, some, they got worn from the wheel flanges, which are stainless on the locomotives, on the brass locomotives. And so uh, we have had to replace some of the uh, curved sections just because we were wearing down the rail profile. And we use nickel silver for those rails. Right, on the replacements, yep, absolutely. 
So there you go. So let's move on to our next topic here. We've got two more to cover. So Rich, this is going to be you talking about foam rocks. And uh, you've seen them as you looked at the layout here. We assembled it. But we'll talk a little bit here about what it takes to make foam rocks happen. So Rich, Thank you you. first, first photograph there. This is part of Sundance Central. That's what I'll be talking about as far as the rocks. But as Jim mentioned earlier, uh, you can use this, this system in any scale, which is great. When uh, we were working on the Sundance Central and I was trying to figure out what we can use for the rocks and, you know, this is the backdrop of the curve section. Uh, if we'd have done that in plaster, I don't think we could have moved it. Uh, so I got on the internet, started researching and came across some guys in Australia that was using this system. And I felt, well, let's try that. And uh, it, I think it worked out very well. But to give you an idea, when you start this, you need a, uh, a base for the material. And Jim, if you got a first, well, that's a close up of the, uh, the rocks with the right. texture coating on it already. But if you flip maybe, okay. This is the extruded foam we were talking about earlier. It comes in various thickness. This I think is two inch or inch and a half. But this is what we use to build up our formation for the rock, for the foam rocks to attach to. It's easy to cut in a table saw or even a, a knife. And we stack this, we glue them together using Gorilla Glue on your layout. And then we use a sure foam file to file that foam to get the general shape of the uh, mountain area that we're gonna attach the foam rocks to. And what we, what this slide is showing you is the foam rubber that we use. Uh, it comes in various thicknesses. There's different colors. There's the gray, there's the green. And you can get this at like Joanne Fabrics. You can uh, buy this in different thicknesses. I found out the easiest way to cut this is an electric knife, which works out very well. Yeah, more fun Next. than carving the turkey. Pardon me? And more fun than carving a turkey. Yeah, right. <laughs> this is what happens when you rip the foam apart. This is the kind of structure you get. And you can see all the uh, intricate details of a rock formation. And what's nice about this, even when you attach it to the extruded foam later on, you can always come back and add other pieces of the foam rubber in areas you think you want to change. So it's nice to work with. When we attach it to the extruded foam, again, we use the Gorilla Glue and we use some long uh, finish nails into the foam until that glue dries up. And once that's set, Jim, you got a next. Here's where we start applying uh, it's a tile grout and cement, and it comes sanded and unsanded. Uh, what we used on the Sundance Central was a sanded to give it a little more texture to the rock because it's a larger scale. And I would recommend probably using the unsanded material for the smaller scale stuff. And you okay. can see basically I've started some of the color that uh, you can apply to that. Use acrylic paints or, uh, or dry powders or Bragdon or Dr. Ben's powders. So Rich, Jim, a question, one couple of, it seems to be that to get this rock face, to get this, this feeling that you're, you have a rock face like this, the thing to remember is people should not cut with scissors or knife or anything the rock face. It's gotta be ripped apart, torn, grab yes. one side and the other and you want a natural tear. Right. Right. Correct. And so this and is what I say, you can always add smaller pieces to areas that you want to bring the rock out further or right. indent something or whatever. Right. And then but, on your part yeah. about the uh, 
a tile grout, sanded or unsanded, it's a good point. And probably in HO, I would use the unsanded. And you know, you're going to be using the same foam, but you could also, you could fill in some of these details if it's too rough for you. You can determine how rough you want your rocks to be. It's the, uh, the tile grout is pretty easy to work with. It comes in a plastic tub. You can get it at Lowe's or Home Depot, right? Yeah. And the thing when I was looking online with the Australian guys, they were using drywall compound. Of course, they were working in smaller scale. I think if I'd have used it on the large scale, I think it would crack and yep. uh, fall off eventually. The tile grout seems to hold up much better. And plus, it's still pliable. I mean, you can push into this and you can see it's kind of a, a foam. Yeah, these are not brittle. I mean, you can put yeah. your finger in there and push it in a little bit and it'll spring right back. Yeah, it's forgiving. All right. Yeah, so here's another picture of some of the stacking and coloration. Yeah, the different things you can stack to make different rock formations that you want. This is kind of a layer effect. Uh, so it's just up to you how you want to approach it and the different formations. Uh, this is the adhesives from tile grout that we use. And uh, as I said, this is one that's uh, sanded and you can also get it in the unsanded. It comes in uh, various colors, but mostly Home Depot and Lowe's carry the uh, white or the gray. Uh, as you can see, the rocks we had the gray applied. Did you but add any I color to the uh, tile grout when you put it on, Rich? Pardon me? Did you mix in any color with the tile grout or you just added all the color? No, later? no, it just comes right out of the tube use a large brush and just brush it on. Have a little water handy to uh, thin it out just a little if you need to. But you just brush it on, let it dry. Then you come back and now you start adding your colors to that. Okay, here's another picture talking about your colors. Tell us what you're doing. Yeah. Here. We use acrylic colors. I mean, you can get these at Michael's or Joann Fabrics. Uh, and then also the powders, as I mentioned, Bragdon or Dr. Ben's, several different colors that you can use. And uh, you want to start with like a base color for the rock and then come back and start adding the various shades and give you some shading area. You know, the rocks are overlapped one another. Here's another example of some coloration, right? Yeah, the coloration where you can see that, you know, you got the uh, the darker colors and the crevices of the rocks, uh, some of the lighter stain, tan colors there. Yep, and here's another example here, closer up. Yeah, it's a close up. You see what the rocks look like. And it really gives you the, a nice texture with that tile ground. Yeah, so the foam rocks have been a real uh, a bit of blessing for us. We never could have moved this layout with the rock faces that we have if we weren't using it, but it really produces a realistic uh, rock face. And once you start working with it, you know, there's so many things you can do with it. So is oh, there yeah. anything else that you wanted to add, Rich, on this topic? No, that's about it. It's a pretty simple process, and uh, I think it comes out very well. And it's lightweight. That's the biggest thing, you know. As you saw earlier, moving this thing, you want to try to keep everything down to a, a minimal weight. Right. Uh, I think that rock face that's at the turntable doesn't weigh, but maybe a couple of pounds at the most. Yeah, and it's two and a half feet tall. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, there you go. So have some fun with foam rocks. Get a piece of foam rubber. You probably have a seat cushion somewhere. I've torn apart a couple of seat cushions that didn't need any more. Or where do you buy the foam at, at uh, um, Rich? The place I found is Joanne Fabrics. Okay. They sell it because it's uh, used for cushions and what. And as I said, they have it in several different thicknesses. Uh, if you can't find it there, you go to an upholstery shop that they, uh, they stock the foam using for their cushions and what. Cool, there you go. 
Well, John, we're heading your way next on our segment here for Wuthering Wood. So if you can unmute yourself. Rich, okay. thanks for the, the info here on the rocks. Hopefully some, some of our viewers will try it, have some fun with it, but there's uh, a lot you can do. And once you do try it, you know, you see what our, you can reach us through our site or our Facebook page, you know, let us know how it goes. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to, uh, to answer them for you. All right, so John, let's talk about Weathering Wood. That's your segment coming up now. Uh, okay. This, this is a shot from Silverton Central, your layout that's in the center, right? Uh, right, yeah, that's uh, the, my tribute to Tim Godfrey, uh, a member, unfortunately, that we lost recently and uh, to cancer. And um, this was actually a building I saw on, um, I actually saw this on um, George Selios's layout. I didn't know it was one of his signature kits at the time because I wasn't familiar with a lot of his uh, kits that he produced. But I really liked it and I took a picture of it. Uh, unfortunately, I took a picture of it with a 35 millimeter. So the, the color came out in the picture like this. So I went and bought some English rose paint and that's what I used as my base uh, paint on this. And uh, then when I went back to his layout a couple of years later, I realized that the building was actually a tan color and the color was actually had been way off. <laughs> but I built this, I scratch built this in S scale using um, 1H, 1H, 8 inch uh, clapboard siding, and uh, which is a little large for, for S scale, but clapboard siding, they, they use different sizes that came, they use a lot of different sizes of wood. So uh, it's probably worked better with uh, a smaller clapboard siding size, but this one worked well for that. Um, okay. To finish the wood, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, you don't have using wood doesn't have to be just about buildings, right? Uh, right. Yeah. This is a this is a boat that I I scratch built um, using uh, cardstock and wood. Actually, uh, the hull was made out of cardstock, and the and the uh, cabin was made out of wood and stuff like that. And the fish box is made out of wood. And here's another uh, shot. Yeah. Yeah, this is one of my one of my first attempts at boats uh, using cardstock and stuff. I like it because you can bend it however you want it, and it's easier to bend than wood. But it looks like wood. It's old steel. You you kind of do the same thing to it that you do to wood to make wood look better. You that's what you do the same thing kind of thing to cardstock to make it look that way. Okay, so we'll talk about some of those techniques. We got a couple more examples, pictures, and then we'll have you jump into how you do all this. This is another one from Silverton Central, right? Right, yeah. There's a, there's a you see the wooden deck in front of this uh, Godfrey's, and it's uh, you know that's just strip wood laid on a um, some one eighth inch uh, square pieces of wood that are fr framed up, and then I framed it over with the uh, individual strip wood there on the top of it. And uh, yeah, this is another wood building, um, different kinds of. Uh, siding and you can see the the post and everything everything is kind of finished the same way um which i'm going to give you a brief demonstration of how it's how it's done or but uh you know there's a good close-up you see the nail holes in there and uh you know you can see the lifted boards and the rust coming down and all that kind of stuff the rust is done with powders or sometimes I use acrylic washes to do the rust stains. And um, lately I've used a lot more of um, odorless mineral spirits and artist oils like raw sienna and burnt sienna for rust because you can really control that a lot better. And uh, it brings out the detail in the wood a lot better than using acrylic washes. There's another one example. I built this on a weekend at a train show actually over in Tampa. I was at my modular railroad over there and I actually built this building while I was uh, sitting around doing little mini clinics and stuff. So John, People I got were, a question for you on the nail holes. Are you using a pounce wheel or did you burn those? No, no, it's a pounce wheel. Um, um, right here, I don't know if you can see it or not, um, but it's a, it's a little, it's a little wheel that you get. There's different sizes. Uh, I think Micromart sells a set of three of them with three different sizes, but I use this with a steel edge ruler like this with cork backing on it. And I mark my, at the top, 
in the bottom, I mark line pencil lines, and then I just run it right up the ruler on the wood. And it works really great. So, and okay. uh, I do that, all that stuff before I do any coloring or anything on the wood. So let's continue on here. We've got uh, several of this one. This is the uh, fish camp. This is at the base of the trestle, right? On Silverton. <laughs> Yeah, this is a named after Richard Ranger. And uh, this is, a, he was the guy that came up with the, the sawdust scenery method that we use on the Sundance and Silverton and other railroads. He was the guy that came up with it originally. He was a cabinet maker. But anyway, this building was actually on a small HO diorama I had, and I decided that I was going to use it uh, on my S scale railroad. So I just made the door bigger. And uh, I made the stairs bigger. The railings were already too high. They came up to the neck of an HO guy. So they were perfect for the S scale guys. So it kind of all worked out. <laughs> yeah, and that the was pretty fortunate. Really, yes, it was. And uh, everybody really loves it. And it's, uh, it's, it's it, I really had a lot of fun. This is one of the first buildings I ever scratch built. And I took it back to my mentor uh, multiple times and he tore it up each time telling me this was wrong and that was wrong. He was pretty a gruff guy. But eventually, about the sixth or seventh time I took it back to him, he said, oh, that's the way it should be. So that kind of gave me the discipline to try to do dilapidated structures and understand how it actually it actually works to make them look like this. Uh, yeah, this is another one. This is kind of out of my imagination. I just kind of uh, drew this together and stuff. And uh, it came out actually pretty nice. It was all done. It's... Um, Again, you can see the lifted boards really well on this. There, you take a razor knife and you cut them and lift them up, and and uh, that's kind of what you uh, what you do to get those. And you cut pieces away, and uh, yeah, all that stuff there. You're cutting things away, and uh, it's it's if you. I mean, it's hard for me to build a structure that's not doesn't look like this anymore. It just really is. I don't know. You know, I know guys do it all the time. But it's for me, it's just really hard not to make it look like that. It's just more what about fun. The, the roof material here, what are these patches? This, I guess is a tar paper. What did you use to make that? Well, that is uh, that is Kleenex. And uh, that's just regular old Kleenex. And uh, it's put up there and you you kind of cut it and lay it down. And then you you uh, attach the paint to it kind of a you kind of uh the paint's kind of a wash kind of a cross between a wash and it's and it just naturally goes into all of it and it causes it to wrinkle up like that and uh then when it's all dry you go back and uh you dry brush it uh you can come back with artist oils over it later on now did you, you cut those into strips john you just took the kleenex tissue and cut it into strips yeah that's basically what that is yeah, I usually use a uh, regular um, news newspaper and cut it, paint it, and cut it into strips, and use that as my tar paper more right. than this. But because uh, that's easier to control than this, this is a little harder to control. Yeah, but that's that, a nice effect. I've used the uh, learning from you that newspaper uh, strips on a couple of scratch builds I have in HO, and it makes for right. It, it is easier to control, but this has a really nice puckered look to it. Because that's what happens when you get a tissue wet, and then you went back and dry brushed it. Right, right. It it does give a real nice uh, old look, really old tar paper that's seen as better days, of course. So this is the one you want me to show. Where you're going to talk about your techniques specifically, right? Right. Yeah, the techniques on this one are pretty much the same of uh, of, of pretty much all of them that I do. Um, I don't know if you can see this wood or not. But this has got, as you can see where I've gouged the wood and everything like that. And I've kind of lifted it up with a razor knife. And you see my pounce wheel. And what I do before I do any of that is I take a file cleaner brush and I brush the same way as the wood. And that's the same way I do with this little strip wood. I brush, take a file cleaner brush and I go down the wood like this. That's the first thing I do. And um, then the second thing I do, if I'm going to paint the wood, I decide what color it's going to be. And I use regular basic, just as regular, this Apple Barrel's typical acrylic paint that I'll use. I'll use it whatever color I'm going to be. A lot of times I'll com combine a couple of colors, but I'll paint that on there. 
and I kind of, it's kind of like a heavy dry brush thing that I do. I'm not covering all the wood. What I'm doing is I'm painting a heavily dry brushing it, but not, I want some wood to show through. And so John, I got I a do, question for you. You mentioned on the, um, on the file brush, that, that, how coarse is that's a metal brush that you're using to clean a flat file. That's what you're talking about. Right. It has a lot of metal, little tiny metal hairs on it that are, it's pretty stiff. And uh, you can, like I said, it puts, it adds to the wood grain that's already there. And uh, it, it makes it much more pronounced. And that's important later on when you go back and start staining the wood. It's not so important now, but when you stain the wood, that's when you really start to get the, uh, the detail to pop out. And that's kind of one of the last things you do. Here's another view of that same building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, you can see the lifted, uh, lifted boards and stuff like that. Again, this one was painted with not just yellow, but there was some, there was uh, like some white in there to kind of make the yellow lighter in places. And then sometimes more yellow to make it darker in places. It was kind of a combination of, of two colors of white and yellow. And I wasn't worried about how bright it was going to be because I knew that it was going to be toned down eventually with the washes that go over the top of it. Yeah, there's another example of, uh, and you can see the board that I pulled down there. There's a board that uh, is hanging down there. It, got, it kind of naturally happened and then I just glued it in place so that it, it would stay there later on when I came back and colored the, the wood and stuff. So you're, you're painting that wood with, it sounds like, basically watered down acrylic paints, right? Well, it's not really watered down. It's really, uh, I, I paint them, I use it right out of the bottle like it is, but I'm, what I'm doing is I may have a pile of white and a lot of yellow, and once in a while, I'll dip the brush in the white and the yellow to get a different color streaking on some of the boards. And take so, some of the paint off as though you're dry brushing, right? And you're, yeah, your kind of dry brush is pretty, you're putting it on heavy, a lot more heavier than you would if you were gonna dry brush something. It's right. pretty heavy. Now, what about the washes after you get your, in this case, like yellow, faded yellow colors, what washes did you use to bring it out the wood? Well, I learned this from Dave and the late uh, Brian Nolan. I used to use all acrylic washes on all my stuff and, and they came out pretty nice. But the problem with acrylic washes is you're working with wood. It really wants to warp the wood and that's just causes you all kinds of problems later on, especially when you're trying to put the structure together. Cause essentially you want to work on all the walls flat as long as you can before you glue the structure together. I've found the longer you can work on the walls, any detailing signage, anything you're going to do, you want to work on them while they're flat. As so then your you washes, put, John, are they odorless mineral spirits with a little bit of oil? Yeah, this, this is a, a typical kind of a artist oil that I use. This is Payne's Gray. Yeah. And, and this is one of the ones that I really love. And I, use, uh, I also use some raw sienna on there. And then I have this get the Payne's up. Gray, it almost looks black. It's a very dark gray, right? Yes, it is. It, it really does. It, it, has, it looks like it has to me a little tiny bit of blue in it too, I, from what I've seen of it. But um, it just it finds all the capillaries, um, all the nail holes, they just, all these nail holes, they just pop out at you and you get some just fantastic effects with it. It's just, it's wonderful. And you can control it real easy. If you get too much on, you can see here, here are some different colorations of different things, you know, different things I've been experimenting with and you can see different ways you can color wood and get different effects. Uh, but again, the, the nail holes, they used to disappear sort of with acrylic um, washes. And now with, with these uh, oil-based washes, they just, they just pop out at you right away. You don't, and I mean, they're just- warping, right? Right, very little warping. I always do both sides of the wood too. And this, this technique applies to, of course, strip wood too. It's the same kind of thing. If you're doing just strip wood with no painting at all, then you're just gonna, you're gonna do the, uh, um, this one, the only thing that different I would do with this one is I had to, you can see where I ran a, a wood burner on this one a little bit. I don't know if you can see that or not, but there is some wood burning done on that. It's not really pronounced on this one that much, but there is some wood burning that's done on that. Same so, with this next shot, John, is there wood burning going on here on that floor? 
There is. Yeah. That floor that the uh, poker players are setting on, that's all, that's all wood burning on there. You can see the lines. It makes the, the lines more pronounced. And um, I was talked into buying a wood burner by Dave and I, I really, I just, I love the thing. The thing is fantastic. You can do just everything. I even use it on cardstock wood, everything else. So kind of sets that on fire, but you again, you can see some wood burning in here on the floor and uh, just uh, pretty much everywhere. Uh, there's just wood burning I've used all over the place. So, it, so uh, if we it, were it, going to sum up these techniques, John, you would say one, take your raw wood. What did you do? Before, did you do anything to the raw wood before you started to apply the acrylic paint? Well, basically my formula is take the uh, file cleaner brush and brush the same way as the grains on the okay. wood. And then, uh, you know, use your pounce wheel and your straight edge ruler and figure out where you, whether you're going to be working in HO. For HO, for making nail holes, I, HO, uh, I do them about a qu quarter inch apart, about three eighths inch apart for S scale and about a half inch apart for O scale. But basically you make all your nail holes and you gouge your wood. If you're making a dilapidated building, you gouge your wood. You work your wood pretty good before you do any kind of uh, painting or staining or any of that kind of stuff. Cause you really wanna, uh, you wanna have all that stuff done and not, you know, not have to go back later. So then you're and, gonna go back with the heavy dry brushing to give you some variation right. in your base color, right? Right, and if you're gonna have- that dry, then you're gonna go back with that wash with the mineral spirits and the paints gray? Yes, and I also use, uh, I use uh, Bragdon and other people make weathering powders like this one right here. And I use some of those sometimes when I apply those with the washes because that also, they also find all the little cracks and crevices and the wood grain and the nail holes and all that kind of stuff. They find all that stuff real easy because it just flows naturally into all that stuff. And again, I do both sides of the wood uh, just to make sure that it, uh, no warpage. Right. Okay. Well, John, thank you very much. A lot of, lot of really helpful tips there. Hopefully, you know, some people viewing will try some of these things and experiment with it. You know, the good news is you can try with a spare piece of wood or siding or whatever and see how it works. And if it doesn't work, you can go back and adjust your technique before you actually do a building, right? Absolutely. Yeah. That's where I, I, did a lot, I do a lot of practice sometimes and I'm going to especially using a new color or something on, on a building, I'll do, I'll take a piece of strip wood and, or a piece of siding and just kind of play with it a little bit to see what I'm, what I'm going to end up with. Maybe I don't want to use that color, you know? All right. So. All right. Well, thank you, John. Very helpful. Very informative. Keith, did we cover off all the questions? I know a couple of things popped up in chat. Yeah, I, I got them all. Uh, there was one comment that um, even after the center opens again, whether it be, uh, you know, in a few months or, you know, way down the road. Um, there was a couple of comments that uh, wanted to know if we could continue this, you know, as an offset for the people that can't make it out to see the center in person, but they enjoy all of the little mini clinics that we have on and all the discussion that goes around. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have any plans to take the layout on the road. Um, we were really happy to have a permanent home. Um, but the, uh, Certainly we can uh, keep sharing these techniques, absolutely. Okay, all right, so um, a couple of reminders. We have a YouTube channel. If you haven't been there, you should go there. Uh, we post a lot of things on the YouTube channel. And if you go there, and in fact, all of these, uh, the recording of this particular webinar and all the webinars we've done are also on our YouTube channel. So you can watch them or send them to your friends. They can watch them anytime. If you go there and you like what you see, be sure to like and hit that like button and subscribe. We're looking to build our subscriber base. The bell icon, if you've been to YouTube before, tells you, you know, give you a little notification when we post something new. I'll be posting the, uh, the video of this particular webinar by tomorrow and then share it with all your friends. We really love to share these techniques and you know, the good news about model railroaders is they love to share what they do and we all learn from each other. I remember too, our website, um, the uh, finescalemodeling.org. If you're not on our mailing list already, you can sign up for it there. We'll get you on the mailing list and keep you informed of events we're doing, directions for when you eventually do come to the center where we're opening events. And there's an online gift shop there 
or additional things if you'd like. So again, thank you all for joining us um, on this, this webinar. We will see you next month. We'll have a January virtual webinar, the third Saturday of the month. So make a note of it, watch in your email inbox as we send you a notice about that. We hope to see you back for the next ones and uh, to get your thoughts as we go forward. And uh, since it'll be January and a new year when we speak to you, happy holidays to you and everybody, to your families. Hope you have a great time together. Get some time together even in today's environment. And we'll see you next month. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.